The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On the first day of the week at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified, and they bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, it was Joanna, it was Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He stooped and looked in. He saw the living clothes by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Christ is alive. He is not here at the tomb. He is risen. Remember what he said. These first witnesses of the empty tomb had some serious aha moments amidst their grief. As they made their way to the tomb early in the morning, spices in hand, they had a job to do. They suddenly found that their friend who had died, though, was not there. Add to the confusion, they encountered two men in dazzling clothes. Now these aren't just fancy clothes we're talking about. Dazzling, the word means they were bright. They were blinding clothes. Who describe Jesus as one who is living. Why do you look for the living among the dead? You're in the wrong place. The women tell the story to the rest of the followers, as we heard in the gospel lesson, but of course, they're not believed. Now this is the part of the Easter lesson in Luke where most women roll their eyes. You know the emoji, right? <laughs> they know the drill about being accused of telling idle tales. And the guys have to go check it out, even though the guys have been hiding. The women go and find out first, but the guys have to check it out for themselves. In a humorous way, I can almost see Mary Magdalene walking over to Peter and pushing him into the tomb and saying, Is it empty? <laughs> Do you believe me now? Whatever the response was. For the disciples who had been witnesses to Jesus' many words, about how he would die and he'd be raised again. Every one of us, too, had been surprised at some point in our lives to find God alive in places where we could only imagine death. Psalm 23, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Thou art with me. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus Christ is alive, just as he said. We hear God's promises. We trust God's promises. And God comes through on God's promises. Our resurrection day today is a day of fulfilled promises. I'd like to take you back for a moment tonight to the 1990s. I know that was last century. 1990s. I traveled the mid-Atlantic states for four years each week, setting up brand new Rite Aid stores. That's why there's a Rite Aid store on every corner in some markets. And remodeling others. 
we actually put up 25 Rite Aids in the Tidewater, Virginia area. And I met plenty of new people along the way. One of the freight companies that would deliver goods to these stores, and I'd be surprised if it pulled up here to the curb today, was called God Freight. G period, O period, D period, God. Guaranteed overnight delivery. It was just, have you ever had one of those trucks pass you on the highway? You had God drive past you? It was the equivalent of DHL or FedEx or today. Our team of merchandisers always had this fun little thing you could only imagine that we would do when God pulled up to the store. We would joke, God is here, and then we would have some fun with the store people. We were setting a new store somewhere in Virginia, and I saw God pull up to the front curb. I searched out the store manager because, you know, I wanted to do this little fun thing. I said, God is here. He said he was coming back. <laughs> and she looked at me suspiciously. And I said, for real, go, go check it out. I'm in the curb. Now, this particular woman was a person of faith. Yes, amen. <laughs> wow, that's like, she's going to be a good choir member. This woman and I had had a couple of conversations already that week. In my own life, as many of you know, I was in the midst of 10 years of being unchurched. She and I both spoke a familiar God language. We seem to be equally in this language aware of God's promises. I'm not 100% sure where she was on her pathway, but I was running up and down quite a few garden paths, searching out tombs, often hiding, listening to good news from others. I had my doubts along the way, and I had my joys along the way. Not quite knowing what to expect in life from a God who had so many promises. Surely I was looking for God. In those years, I found God around more than one corner. The store manager. I watched her walk cautiously through the front door of the store, those security blinds were down so she couldn't see out the front windows. She was so curious. God is here. She looked around the corner to the right and I could see her profile as she read the graphic on the side of the truck. And I'd see her turn around on her heel, come back in. As she walked back into the store to make space for the goods that were being delivered, she was shaking her head at me. She said, you're not right. <laughs> Let me take you back to something else, too, in history called a CD. You remember what CDs were? Remember those metal things? And I still have some, too. And I carried CDs in the car, and I listened to music most Monday mornings and in Friday afternoons, I was on the road. I was traveling back and forth. We did a lot of work in Baltimore. There were some good concerts that would happen along the way. Those are my desert days when the angels would feed me by the ministries of people like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. I was fed as well by an angel named Whitney Houston. Speaking of somebody from the past. Whitney may be an unlikely source for hearing the good news. The story we often hear from the tabloids and did hear from the tabloids is about bad relationships and the things that took Whitney down and eventually killed her. We don't always hear that walk that she had with God especially in a song that I discovered not too long ago, I Look to You. 
Winter storms have come and darkened my sun. After all that I've been through, who on earth can I turn to? I look to you. After all my strength is gone, and you I can be strong when melodies are gone. And you, I hear a song. I look to you. The CD I had it with me was a different style of music than that. It was from The Preacher's Wife. Does everybody know the movie The Preacher's Wife? Some of you might know that really old movie, The Bishop's Wife, possibly. I heard her tell the story of how she and the Georgia Mass Choir, that was the choir that served as the church choir in that video, how that they would sing for the, the movie. And while they were taping the movie, at some point when the movie director liked the shot that was captured, he would yell, okay, cut, 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 we got it. And Whitney said they would keep singing. And the set was full of rejoicing, and they would dance around that set. And they would continue to praise God. In Whitney's words, they were having church. I believe it was during those times that Whitney was reminded of what Jesus had said, what Jesus had promised. Jesus was alive to her. Amidst the turmoil of life's rough seas, perhaps Whitney stepped out on the island of God's grace and danced in the aisle with her Savior. I had a Mormon Tabernacle Choir CD. This particular album was a favorite church hymn. One hymn that was most meaningful to me is a hymn that we are going to sing today as our sending hymn. I know that my Redeemer lives. In our hymn book, we sing it to the tune of Duke Street. I knew a different tune from the Mormons. It was one that was a little more reflective. And there are some differences in the lyrics. In my days of traveling down wandering roads, being watched over by a God who was full of promises, I would sing along these precious words. I want to teach you this tune. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives who once was dead. He, he lives, my ever-living head. He, he lives to bless me with his love. He lives to plead for me above. He lives my hungry soul to feed. He lives to help in time of need. He lives to grant me rich supply. He lives to guide me Comfort me when faint. He lives to hear my soul's complaint. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. He lives triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. He lives exalted, throned above. He